You're a wizard, Harry. I'm a what? Books lead us. I mean, we are in a good position of having had Joe Rowling provide us with fantastic source material. All you have to do is read the books to kind of, I think, sense the place, the sort of tone and atmosphere, which I thought she'd done, you know, and she continues to do so brilliantly. In the very first film, Joe came to the set when we were designing, coming up with a lot of the designs, and had a look through everything to make sure that we weren't, you know, wildly off. Joe created this world. We wanted to stay true to it, organic to it and that's been our mission. All that vision is born very much from the book, part of the universe that uh, first Chris, now Alfonso, has built upon. Mr. Potter, our new celebrity. From the get-go, what I, I was aiming was serving the material. Well, I think, that's, I think that that's everything of importance. Let's begin the feast. That is very good. Of the five books that are published, writing Azkaban was the easiest, and in some ways I think that shows. Although it's a tricky plot in some ways, as Alfonso will really appreciate, and Steve Clovis, the scriptwriter, will really appreciate, because they've kind of had to negotiate the same ascent that I had to negotiate. At the same time, I, I felt I was really given space to do that, so, I, so it was an enjoyable process. The moment that I read the book, I, I just felt so connected. I, for me, everything was so clear in how it should look as a film and how it should be told as a film. And then working with, having the luxury of working with Steve Klopp is that he's fantastic. We tried to discover the best way to convey what Joe was expressing on the page in, in, in movie terms. And um, that led us to, to some interesting places. You deal with so many abstract concepts, mm -hmm. like the time traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so, such an abstract thing. And actually, it's for so difficult that I even trying to explain it right now. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It is yeah. hard. Because you just go in circles. <laughs> but then in the book, everything makes just perfect sense. I loved watching that part of the film. I loved watching the time turner sequence. There was just enough humor in it. Ow! Just enough near misses. Dumbledore's comment when they come back is just spot on. It's <laughs> perfect. We did it. Did what? Good night. I got to Scotland to meet with Joe. One, I think it's important for Joe to feel comfortable, and two, I think you know, Joe is a wonderful source of information, is incredibly generous with us. And I remember when she walked into the door, I thought, I, for some reason I expected to meet someone who was like 70. Joe walked in, she was younger than I was. We liked the same films, and we liked the same music, and it was just an immediate connection. Wicked. When she met Alfonso, he talked about his vision for the film, talked through many ideas. Alfonso was mentioned very early on, and I was really uh, enthusiastic about the idea. And I loved um, Y tu mama tambien. Alfonso just obviously understands teenage boys backwards, and you know, they're 13 now. These kids were starting to take themselves seriously as actors, so they were willing to explore uh, more emotional territories. He was their friend, and he betrayed them. He was their friend! I was so lucky that I had them so raw and so willing to go there. I think all three of them give their best performances to date. <laughs> oh, oh, Poor Malfoy. He deserves <laughs> it. <though. laughs> he deserves it. But Tom took that punch really well. He, oh. He really did. Oh, he, he, they he loved did a good job it. on that. <laughs> Emma was looking forward for that moment, and I remember Tom telling Emma, oh, if you want, just hit me, just hit me. <laughs> <laughs> what a hero. The universe. It is the universe that you created. You know every corner of that place. Everyone. Everyone? Everyone. Where they are, what they're doing, every minute of every day. Brilliant. This was a map of the world. This drawing is Joe Rowling's drawing that she uh, executed in you know, you know just a, a few minutes. As you see, it has all the principal ingredients. The dark forest is here, the Whomping Willow, the Quidditch pitch, Hog Hogwarts Castle itself. The Black Lake is there, the Perimeter Road, Hogsmeade Village. She had a very, very exact and precise understanding of her world and her creation. She knew exactly the relationship uh, between all the elements. So uh, she was able to give it to us and that became our Bible. We needed a place where the kids could see the execution of Buckbeak. And we thought about having a, a, a graveyard. And uh, when we consult Joe about it, he says, no, the, the, the graveyard is not there. 
uh, uh, and I said, why? And then she gave me the whole explanation why the graveyard cannot be there because it's in a different place of the castle because it's going to play. And she knows her thing. She knows exactly what's going to happen later. And once I, I remember having little people in some storyboards playing some keyboards in an organ in the Great Hall. And Joe said, no, uh, there are no pe little people in this, in this universe. I said, yes, but it's like Lilliput kind of thing. I said, yes, yeah, it's a lovely image, but they, they don't, they, they don't make sense mean. in this I wouldn't universe. let him do it. That's not fair, is it? She was just about trying to serve as much as possible the story and the spirit of the story, because that's what is great of the book, because you, the third book is, for me, so abstract and, and deals with so many different abstract concepts, but at the same time, it's in the frame of an adventure. I think it's very, very important that Alfonso Cuaron be allowed to make this his own film. Action. It's important that any director come into a situation like this and feel the freedom, feel empowered to make it their own. That's how you're going to get the best films. Pretty much all the decisions, the visual decisions, were made as we were shooting, not in the cutting room. We made most of deci those decisions while either on the storyboard or, or when, where, when we blocked the scene with actors, we worked with the actors and when we decided how to approach the scene. Oh, well done, Harry. Well done. What he's done is he's built from the foundations of the book, built from the foundations that Chris Columbus established in the first two, but made it very much his own to serve the story. God. <laughs> Alfonso has had very good intuition about what would and wouldn't work. He's put things in the film that without knowing it, um, foreshadow things that are gonna happen in the final two books. So I really got goosebumps when I saw a couple of those things because I thought people are going to look back on the film and think those were put in deliberately as clues. Jo wants the movies to be faithful to the books. On the other hand, she realizes that they're completely different mediums. To be entirely faithful to these movies would be you know, 16 hours long. In this film, what I found the thing was about a child trying to find his identity as a teenager. Sirius Black was and remains to this day Harry Potter's godfather. We found the theme and then whatever stuck there, we kept and whatever it didn't, sorry. As long as didn't affect or contradict no, either the universe or what is What's to come. Next? Yeah. My biggest concern with the visual effects, I want to make sure absolutely certain that the visual effects would again move up a notch from the last film. The first film we were fairly rushed and the effects were never up to anyone's standards. In the second film we improved them greatly and I wanted to take another leap on this film. We're watching it and we're saying, wow, look at that hippo, it looks really great. And yeah. we're just praising the conceptual artists and the a com uh, the CG uh, artists who make it, that put it together. And then someone says, yes, but don't forget who imagined it that for the, in the first place. And he, he, she, here she is. <laughs> well, I think it's important to say I didn't invent a hippogriff. I, well, I invented that hippogriff, but the, the, the creature, the hippogriff, as you know, exists in, um, in folklore and in, in mythology, so that's not my creation. But I really thought hard about this because it could have been in the book, it could have been an absurdity, and indeed it really could have been in the film as well, but I th you, you made him a real creature. There are not that many iconographic representations mm. of hippogriffs, and that's something that we discover is very interesting. There mm -hmm. are sphinx, there are several sphinx, mm -hmm. or you, you see... Uh, uh, creatures that are half bird and half cat, a, a lot of yeah. different things. But for hippogriffs, actually, it was hard to find. I knew that because I went you looking. Yeah. I went looking. I could hardly find any anyway. No, I know. So it's I felt a complete liberty to invent. <laughs> I had a nightmare when I was in my teens in which I saw hooded gliding figures. And they could almost be figments of your imagination, of a sort of, of a tortured imagination, as indeed they are. But do you know what I mean? They could be, they could be figments of a mentally ill mind. And um, that, that, that was a whole thing that I was exploring in the book. Harry is particularly vulnerable to them. But he's got a much worse past 
So he would be, you know, it's not weakness, it's just the fact that he's, he's faced me. Mm -hmm. I think Alfonso came up with an amazing design for the Dementors because they truly are unlike anything you've ever seen, but they are a close cousin to maybe what we've all sort of perceived as death over the years, and that's very, very frightening. I thought the shrunken head was very funny. I really liked that. Little old lady at 12 o'clock! I thought I fitted him really well. It was a really funny idea. I mean, I said to Steve Clovis many a time, damn it, I wish I'd written that, you know? So, but obviously that's what you want, isn't it? You want to be working with people who, who come up with great stuff. It, you, it's, it's, it's great, you know, when I'm looking around for all these little bits that, that are completely consistent with the world, but I, you know, I didn't write them. I wish I had, but there you go. Gryffindor! For me, one of the great memories was sitting in a room with Steve Clovis, Joe Rowling, and David Heyman, the producer, and just the four of us for several weeks discussing Quidditch, talking about what it's going to look like. I'll say one, two, three, and action. The food appears. Set, one, two, three, action. And that excitement, that sense of making something really special was uh, something that I took with me through the making of the first film and the second film. The overall process was incredibly open and incredibly creative. I think in this case, the book and the director were, just, were really made for each other. There's a unity about the film, there's a consistency about its tone and its feeling that's very, very enjoyable for me. And that's not a very easy thing for, for the author of the original material, and I'm completely happy about what more can I say. Expecto Patronum!